The Time Machine Did It, Chapter 18 As Mandible took me around the town, showing me what had happened to it now that his grandfather had never been in a position to nip the criminal syndicate in the bud, an amusing thought occurred to me. I have this humorous side to my nature. I guess this is as good a time as any to mention that. I had noticed that Mandible was sort of like the ghost of criminal future, showing me around and so forth. I asked him if he'd read Dickens. He told me to shut my mouth. We didn't talk about literature any more after that. But I still think it was an amusing reference. He was right about the city. It certainly had changed. I guess I should have noticed. What are people paying me for, anyway? Gone were all the things the Mandible family had built. The sports stadiums, the libraries, the civic auditoriums, the roller skating rinks. In fact, every fun or interesting thing people did in this town. All of it had been replaced by whorehouses, gambling hells, gambling hells, I don't know, if that's, probably gambling halls is what it's supposed to be, okay, opium dens, and all manner of other unsavory things. The only thing left for a decent person to do on Saturday night was to get robbed, and robbed they were, sometimes as often as 20 times an hour. Criminals were completely out in the open now. Policemen not only weren't arresting them, they were actually joining them. This is how a city where the police are as bad as the criminals, said Mandible, and where honest private investigators like you are harassed by corrupt policemen. That was some, certainly something I had noticed. I frowned. We had a good, he had a good point there. We've got to do something about that last thing, I thought. I suggested Mandible go back in time and do all the dirty work himself. That would be better. I didn't like 1941, and it didn't like me, so he could go. I would stay here, sort of standing guard. He asked what he was paying me for. I reminded him that he hadn't actually paid me anything yet. He dismissed this as mere wordplay. He said he was too old to go gallivanting around time and space. I was young and strong and resourceful. Besides, there might be dangers. He needed to send someone who was expendable. I had to admit I was pretty expendable, all right, now that I thought about it damned expendable. He finally clinched the deal by upping the amount of money he was theoretically going to pay me, to double my normal rate. That sounded like money I could theoretically use, so I agreed. But this time, I was going to go back prepared. I went home and loaded up with all the things I'd wished I had had the first time around. I started with a lot of cash, making sure that all the bills were printed before 1941. I got a nice warm coat, an almanac so I could win bar bets, and also wrote down a good answer to give some guy I had been having an argument with back there. Then I took a shower, because I remembered that someone in 1941 had suggested I do so. Once I was absolutely sure I had packed everything, that nothing, I, uh, that nothing had been overlooked, I reached for a briefcase. For the briefcase. It was gone. Somebody had broken into my home and stolen it. I probably should have noticed the muddy footprints on my floor before. They were all over the house. You practically couldn't see anything else. They led through the broken window, up to where I had stashed the briefcase, then into the kitchen, following the muddy tracks. I saw that the intruder had made some lunch for himself, then doubled back to the living room, where he apparently watched some of my videotapes, then into my bedroom for some jumping on the bed, then back to the living room, where he left by a different broken window. I would have been concerned, but since I knew what the burglar had stolen, I figured it wouldn't be too difficult for me to find it again. I took a walk down the street, looking for something inexplicable. Sure enough, a couple of blocks from my house, I saw an elevator suddenly appear on the sidewalk, and a crook come out, pulling a horse that had medieval night on it. About thirty crooks and a few crooked cops were standing in line, waiting their turn with the machine. I didn't hesitate. I always take time travelers by surprise, they say. While the crook was wrestling with the horse and dodging the lance blows of the knight and telling the knight to either quit calling him a varlet or tell him what it meant, I hurried up the elevator and, ignoring the line entirely, dove in and closed the door. There was general outrage about this line cutting. The crooks began pounding on the door. The cops in line began blowing their whistles. As quickly as I could, I set the dials for October 12, 1941, turned on the machine and began hurtling back through time. On an impulse, I mooned most of the 1950s as I went by. I don't know what makes me do these things. I guess it's just part of my charm. <laughs>